My name is Sandor Beragi. Thanks for the introduction. I'm indeed from Imperial College London. Um, one thing probably to add to what's on the screen that I'm currently at the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology, but I'm actually an engineer by training, which is important from the perspective I take on this question I'm trying to answer whether we can actually control an epidemic in uh, real time uh, with noisy data using feedback control, which is a common technique uh, in uh, engineering. Um, yeah, maybe one more additional thing to add that this is a relatively new uh, field for me. So um, this is obviously an ongoing study. Everything is, is very new, so feel free to comment on it. And I'm really uh, interested to hear uh, what you what you think about my early results. So basically the type of control I'm looking at is uh, realized by so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions which uh, where we are fortunate or unfortunate so I don't really have to introduce them very much because we recently had the COVID pandemic. So basically non-pharmaceutical interventions are especially important at an early stage of a new outbreak when Basically, there is no vaccine available or no uh, medicine available against uh, certain infectious disease. So basically, what uh, in, in, in this case, um, the policymakers or, or the authorities can do to uh, reduce the spread and uh, save the uh, capacity of the healthcare system is to encourage or mandate people uh, to... Uh, distance themselves, uh, stay at home, wear masks or wear masks or, or uh, limit their contacts. Um, so the main problem or the main issue with, with these kind of measures that they are obviously uh, cause a lot of disruptions to our daily lives and also to the economy. So for example, I just have one figure here showing the ONS uh, data of the UK GDP suggesting that during the first COVID lockdown we had like around a 25% drop uh, uh, in the gross domestic product. And not to mention other uh, less materialistic impact to everyday life like uh, uh, the one on the mental health and the general well-being uh, of the people which then later of course could materialize in, 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 uh, in, in other costs related to additional care uh, which needs to be provided uh, for the people. So my starting point is that obviously none of the two extremes are good. So, so we don't want everything just happen without any interventions, but going for a full lockdown and not caring about uh, these costs is probably also a bad idea. So ideally, one would uh, try to strike a good balance between the cost of the infections and the cost of the uh, actual interventions, which is not a trivial problem. Probably this um, goes without saying also with uh, our previous experiences from COVID. So the question I'm asking uh, for myself is whether it's actually possible to create an effective but also an economical control policy uh, which can balance between these costs. And my idea is to use feedback control strategy, which is a, which is a common thing uh, in engineering to to control uh, dynamical systems to a desired state. And, um, but there is actually a lot of debate and discussion uh, around this topic uh, in the context of epidemiology, whether this is actually feasible, given that the data um, uh, we have about diseases is uh, usually severely affected by noise and uncertainty. For example, by time delays, uh, in the reporting of the of the new infections or, or under reporting of the cases which just basically makes everything a lot more uncertain than as i'm used to or i, I was used to uh, as an engineer when everything was more or less clear even in a relatively noisy experiment so what, basically what i'm trying to do here is just to explore what limits noise imposes uh, on the space of the possible control uh, strategies, what is actually feasible and uh, whether a sophisticated control actually um, makes sense or maybe something more simple like an ad hoc or a threshold based policy is actually better um, given these uh, uncertainties. Okay, so I'm, first I 
probably should introduce what I actually mean by feedback control because I realize that this might not be obvious to everyone. So basically, if we uh, consider a, a classical feedback control loop, then uh, one of the most important part of it uh, is the actual system called a plant in the control theory uh, language, which we actually try to control to, do, to a desired state. So this plant or the system which we are observing uh, uh, is generally considered as a dynamical system, has some uh, states which we can observe. And basically what we do is uh, that we feedback uh, this output state in real time, compare it to a reference, and then based on an error we have a controller which can act. Now if you translate this uh, to the epidemiological uh, language or plant or the system which we would like to control is the population or more like the epidemic that's uh, ongoing uh, in a particular uh, population. Um, the output state I'm going to use uh, will be the number of new infections, which we, uh, in epidemiology this is also called as incidence. And uh, the reference or, or the control target uh, is uh, something you can think about like a level of new infections which we are comfortable with. So you can think of it as, okay, this is the number of infections which we are sure that the healthcare system is going to be able to handle it. We are comfortable with it so, so we can let uh, basically the number of infections increase to that level without, no, without further issues. And uh, then who the controller actually is is also an interesting question. You can think of it as the government or, or somebody who decides on what needs to be done and obviously the, the control input uh, will be uh, the aforementioned non-pharmaceutical interventions. Now I'm going to add uh, a few details to the previous picture because uh, basically uh, the model I'm going to use to describe the epidemic is going to be a stochastic process both uh, in the sense of the process itself, but we can also uh, add some observation noise to the picture. And um, an additional thing to do is, is because our, our goal is to balance between uh, the cost of the infections and, uh, and, and the cost of the interventions, is that we are going to consider a cost or, a cost or, a reward, or a reward function, which uh, we also would like to maximize. Uh, while uh, bringing the system to a desired state. Um, so basically all this uh, makes it useful to consider uh, this structure uh, as a Markov decision process. And uh, now I'm going to uh, int briefly introduce all the elements. So first let's start with the plant or, or, or epidemic model, which is a relatively simple re renewable branching process. So basically this is a stochastic process where I'm uh, calculating the uh, number of new infections using the effective reproduction number and uh, basically this I and the W describe the total infectiousness which uh, is basically a weighted sum of uh, past infections uh, in a certain uh, time frame which is characteristic to the specific um, uh, infectious disease we are dealing with. So for a Markov decision process we basically need four things. Uh, we need some states, transition probabilities between the states, uh, some actions and a reward or a cost function. So based on what I said earlier uh, we are going to use the incidence, so the number of new infections as the states. The state transition probabilities are described by the renewable model I introduced in the previous slide. And the actions uh, I'm considering here are all non-pharmaceutical interventions. So for a basic example, um, I'm considering three possible things which we could do. The first one is doing absolutely nothing. So having no, uh, no restrictions at all. Uh, then there is full lockdown and there is something in between which I'm going to call like a limited social distancing. So basically what these do, uh, what these each do is that they reduce the 
uh, basic reproduction number to a coefficient you can see here. Obviously, no restrictions, don't do anything, whereas lockdown brings it down to uh, one-fifth uh, of the original value. Okay, so the last element for this framework uh, um, that I have to uh, tell you about is the cost function. So basically, the, the, the cost is going to uh, have uh, two parts. One is going to be a penalty term for being off target. Uh, uh, so as I said earlier, I'm, I'm considering a, a target uh, incidence and I'm basically penalizing for, for missing this target. But uh, this um, uh, cost function is, all, is, is actually nonlinear because, because um, I would like to add an extra penalty for basically large overshoots, which we really would like to avoid. So essentially, if we are uh, uh, above 1.5 times uh, the original target, then we add the larger penalty term. And then basically, I'm, 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 I'm considering these costs for, uh, for the actions or our interventions itself. So again, if we don't do anything, that's for free. Um, Limited social distancing has a small cost and lockdown is a heavy instrument. So we're, I'm, I'm, I'm considering a relatively large cost there. And the total cost is basically the combination of these. And uh, <clears throat> when making decisions, then basically based on uh, simulations, I'm trying to uh, maximize uh, um, the discounted reward or, <clears throat> or, or, or in other terms, minimize the cost uh, predicted by our model. And uh, yeah, one last thing we, uh, before I can uh, move on to my result, that while I'm doing this, I'm assuming that uh, the actual reproduction number is unknown to me. So there's an underlying model uh, behind everything. And I'm trying to uh, estimate uh, <coughs> the actual reproduction number based on the data I'm, 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 uh, I'm getting out of the simulations themselves using some uh, standard estimation uh, techniques. Right, so, um, so let's see how this works. Um, I'm going to start with the baseline case, which is, I, I, I can call, call it the ideal case, but, but I also have to mention that it, it is not 100% ideal. But let's say this is ideal in the sense that we have no reporting time delay and no underreporting. So basically, if we use our control and we set a target incidence level, then as you can see, this strategy can uh, more or less um, balance the, the epidemic or, or, the, or the daily new infections uh, around this level. But even to this so-called optimal case, there are some limitations, um, namely that of course, it's not realistic to assume that we have a full real-time control in, in, in case of an epidemic. So, for example, um, in this case, I'm assuming that uh, we can review our policies, so, so decide on a, new, um, on, a, on a new approach or a new action every seven days. So, basically, that's uh, why even in, uh, even in the optimal case, um, the best you can basically achieve is some sort of an oscillation around your, around your, around your target value. And um, yeah, obviously this is, a, as, as I already mentioned, a stochastic process. So, so I'm, I'm always evaluating these results uh, using statistics from an ensemble of uh, 1,000 simulations. And basically the metrics I'm going to use to evaluate uh, uh, evaluate um, the simulations themselves is going to be looking at the peak incidence, uh, the steady state solution envelope, which is basically the difference between the minima and the maxima once uh, uh, the epidemic is under control. And I'm also looking at the, uh, the total uh, number of, of cases across this uh, time frame. Okay, so let's uh, start to ruin our, our control or, or let's, let's, let's start to look at less idealistic uh, scenarios, starting with uh, the case of reporting time delay. So basically, um, um, the, the type of delay I'm, I'm, I'm considering uh, uh, in this model is a stochastic one. 
in nature, which means that um, in calculating the reported cases, I'm sampling uh, from binomial distribution um, where this kernel uh, and the weight functions are described by a gamma distribution, meaning that basically I can, okay, I see I have a limited time, so I, I try to speed up. So basically, what I have, I, I can consider two things for, for this distribution. One is the mean or the expected time delay, which in all of these curves is uh, seven days. And uh, there is a shape parameter alpha, which essentially describes the dispersion of the time delay. So I can consider uh, an almost uh, deterministic light time delay when it's going to be almost constant. And I can consider alpha equal one, which is uh, actually the exponential distribution. In this case, there's going to be a large dispersion of time delays. So basically, if we add time delay to the picture, then our control is going to perform slightly less uh, nicely as uh, in the previous case. As you can see, uh, uh, there are larger overshoots and uh, we can observe a larger solution envelope. Um, and the case I'm showing, to, uh, I'm, I'm showing in, in this slide uh, corresponds to alpha equal one, which is again a large dispersion case. So that was the exponential distribution. Um, interestingly, things are even worse if, uh, if uh, the dispersion of the time delay is small. So if you have like an almost constant time delay, that seems to be worse, which is not so much a surprising result because uh, um, this was actually already demonstrated in, in, uh, in a system identification example. Um, now we have uh, so now, now we see something similar in, uh, uh, in, in the case of control. Basically, the, the, the brief explanation for, it, uh, for this is that if you have a large dispersion, you still have some information of more recent data. So that's why that's slightly better. Um, probably for the sake of time, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping to, to, to this uh, picture straight away. And uh, so basically what I'm doing here is I'm considering um, uh, cases uh, or, 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 or controls with different uh, mean reporting time delays uh, um, and uh, different distribution parameters. And well, it's quite uh, easy to see that the, that the tendency is, is, is quite bad. So, so like a large time delay can really disrupt our control. But um, again, here uh, we see this interesting behavior that actually a large dispersion of, of, of time delay could, could actually have. So if, uh, if you look at the alpha equal one case, then uh, both uh, for, the, for the peak uh, and both uh, for this, the steady state solution envelope, that tends to uh, perform slightly better. Um, Okay, so in the last two minutes, I should briefly say something about case underreporting, which is uh, does something very similar to the time delay. Um, basically, the difference is that uh, in this case, instead of the instead of a instead of the horizontal direction, we have a vertical difference between the reported cases and the actual undergoing uh, uh, incidence uh, in the epidemic. So, the short uh, uh, so to summarize the results uh, briefly, if we have just a brief, uh, uh, ju just a little bit of underreporting, that actually doesn't uh, disturb our control too much. Uh, however, if we take this to the extreme, then basically we have uh, large overshoots and then this doesn't really uh, work so nicely. Uh, there are some histograms here illustrating the same. So in, the, in my last minute, I should say something about the ad hoc policies. Um, basically, in this case, I'm, I'm considering a control when I'm uh, turning, uh, a switching lockdown on and off based on predefined thresholds. So if there are no time delay and no, uh, no underreporting, then uh, you can get something similar to the, to the optimal control case. Obviously, we are using uh, basically more heavy lockdown than in the optimal control. That was kind of expected because that's why we tried to do optimal control. But the main interesting result is if we, cons uh, if, if we compare the performance of the control, then uh, we see that actually the, the tendency 
um, uh, with the time delay, for example, is, is, is more or less similar to the, to the more sophisticated control and the threshold-based uh, uh, simpler policies. So basically, uh, this is an argument for, for, uh, for, for using uh, the optimal control theory. Okay, so obviously, as I said, this is uh, uh, still an ongoing research. There are many limitations to it. Um, I'm not considering basically these things I'm, I'm, I'm listing here. So I'm going to wrap up with, with some, some uh, takeaway message. So to answer uh, the question I, I began with, whether we can control an epidemic in real time in noisy data, the, my answer at this point would be a tentative yes. So in principle, yes, but obviously there are limitations as I demonstrated. And basically the, the two key takeaways, if I, if I need to reduce myself to that, would be uh, reporting time delay and case on reporting uh, can really result in poor epidemic control. So if we could uh, improve the surveillance system such that either we, we, we um, reduce these or, or get some information about them so we can probably correcting for them, then that could really improve pandemic preparedness. Otherwise, if we if we comparing um, the optimal control um, approach and the simpler threshold based approach, then basically the tendencies so far seem to be similar. So there is an argument that then maybe optimal control would be still better given, given the limitations. Okay, thanks for listening and uh, I'm ready for some questions. Great, thanks very much Sando. Uh, any questions? Hi, thanks very much. I was wondering if you had looked at all at um, time varying delay, yeah, reporting delay or time varying under reporting because that tends to be something that you get at the start of outbreaks um, for new yeah so my my, my so, so distribution itself i'm considering doesn't i mean it's time varying in the sense that obviously since you're sampling from a distribution that like every single time step you you're going to have something different but it's not time varying in the sense that the distribution is the same well, yes, in, in that sense, obviously, this is a, also a limitation or, or like an additional detail we could, we could potentially look at. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I, I would say that in, in some sense, I, I have a varying time delay, but, but not, not, not as a time varying thing. It's, it's basically a stochastic delay in nature. Yeah, so I was wondering um, if you looked at what has been done in reality, for example, in the UK, they had a, a, a sampling scheme designed by Oxford together with the ONS, so uh, where they sample people across the country. And this may give you a lower limit what's actually doable in terms of, because there will always be some time delay. So it would be interesting to see Given so, the ideal situation would probably be given by something like a lower limit as to what can be done in reality. So, a realistic ideal situation. So, it would be interesting to see if you get this, you know, where do you get with that sort of realistic situation? So, have you, you know, considered looking at that, that ONS survey to, to see? I mean, the, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean the short as, short answer to that that I haven't looked at it yet, and I probably should. And thanks for the the interesting comment. And maybe what I what I could could add um, on to this that um, obviously, so yeah, it's 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 quite clear just basically given the nature of how um, how basically a single case actually gets into the system that it's not. This, this is not, po it's basically not possible to monitor everything in real time. So that's, that's never uh, going to be the case. Um, so, but may maybe there is a counter argument to this because, because if you have a, 
a, a, a, a well-established, let's say, like, I'm, I'm just talking about hypothetically, obviously, so not everything definite. But if you say like a well, you have like a well-established reporting system where these times are more or less similar or at least constant, so you have a good estimation of what your time delay is, then maybe it's possible to compensate for it. So, so, so when actually I looked at the very idealistic case that there's no time delay, you could think about it as, yes, if I knew that there was this much time delay, I just could look at the data based on that and predict for longer, for example. So that, that's, um, uh, but yeah, this, this is a very important question. So thanks for that. Thanks for the comment. Thanks, really nice um, presentation. So you were looking at a scenario which is really an outbreak um, type of model. Have you considered yeah. kind of using this type of analysis for other types of disease epidemics, or not epidemics, but disease kind of situations? And um, are there kind of duplicity du issues with like using more complicated or more um, computationally expensive epidemic models? Mm. I mean, well, the answer is a yes and no. <laughs> so obviously, if you start adding further details to the model, then probably the picture I, I try to present would be less maybe clear or obvious. Um, so yeah, I have to admit that this model is, is simplified at many points, um, basically for the sake of um, giving a fair comparison to, 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 to scenarios with different characteristic times. So for example, one very trivial thing, which you probably would include if you would actually uh, try to model a real epidemic, is the reduction in the susceptible population as immunity builds up uh, by the infections. And I'm just not having that here because um, well, initially I tried, but I, I found that it's difficult to compare things because basically uh, what turned out that the time scale for the uh, controls with different characteristic time delay was very different. So for quantifying purposes, I, I, I'm, I'm ignoring that. So there are several details which I'm already, I already know I, I, I could do it, but it's just not there because it didn't serve my purposes. So yeah, I, I would say that, that this, this framework is, is relatively flexible. So, so we have some, some, some further plans to extend it by adding some, for example, some further heterogeneity to the model because this basically treats the entire population as a single compartment. We don't really have a, an, an age distribution or a geographical um, distribution anywhere. I think those things would be would be also uh, interesting to look at in longer term. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks. Uh, I was wondering, could you just um, explain how you went about the optimization of your um, uh, objective function? Yeah. So the optimization is. Uh, Yeah, so it's, yeah, I, I probably rushed over it a little bit. So what I'm doing is basically a, uh, a prediction of the expected total cost, um, basically with, with um, using a disc discount factor such that um, the, the, the cost uh, coming from um, the next few time steps is going to be more heavily valued than in the far than those of, those of in the far future. So what I'm doing is basically I'm, I'm having a, a, a policy review frequency, and every time I have to make a decision, I'm doing a simulation based estimation of what the cost actually going to be like, and then just select the policy or the sequence of policies that's locally optimal based on those uh, based on those simulations. So there are, there are actually two types of optimization you can do. Uh, there is one that's kind of embedded in the control. And then if you, um, have, if you look at this model in a more heuristic sense, you can do um, 
an optimization of the hyperparameters based on um, the performance of the actual control strategy where you can actually set for example the control parameters or, or, the, or the coefficients in your control because that's well I didn't really touch uh, on, 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 on that in this presentation but if, if, if you have different numbers obviously your, your re results will be probably different. Yeah, so, so presumably reinforcement learning would be an alternative approach to building a control for this sort of system? Probably so, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks. Uh, just to add to the comment, uh, policy gradient uh, should be a good uh, good strategy for optimizing the cumulative reward, you know, so in reinforcement learning. Yeah, I mean, I mean, definitely. So, 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 so the main, so, so the main, main limitation in this case that um, basically the, the the probabilities are kind of treated as latent. So I have this model, but since I have a large state space, evaluating um, the cost by simulation uh, is basically easier or computationally seems to be a more efficient strategy than using what you suggest. But yep, that would be probably an alternative, which I haven't looked into, but maybe will. So thanks. We also have an online question. So uh, this control model seems to be aiming to satisfy a condition at a given time. Is it possible for it to aim for an overall measure, for example, to control the total number of deaths rather than the incidence at a given time? And if so, how do you think that would affect the interventions it suggests? Um. I mean, the, 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 the type of control um, um, uh, they are suggesting, I think, would be um, using a slightly different framework. So, so if 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 we would look at like the total number of deaths or 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 something that's like a more heuristic measure of the epidemic, that would probably take um, longer and much more large scale uh, predictions. Various. The type of control I'm using is is more um, is is more more using some uh, short time frame like uh, um, like a couple of let's so think about like a couple of weeks, but definitely in a in a, a smaller time frame than the than the whole epidemic uh, as a prediction. So in principle, I I I don't see a, see a problem, but obviously just taking what I have right now. Um, wouldn't wouldn't really be it wouldn't really be possible to do it uh, with my my model, but I don't see, yeah in, in principle I, I I don't see a a, a problem with, uh, with with extending it to to something like that. Great, um, I've got lots of questions for Sandor, but in the interest of trying to power people up with some caffeine, um, I suggest that we probably leave it there. So let's thank Sandor again. <laughs>